my name is Morna Gerard and I am interviewing Greg Doherty for GSU's Gender and Sexuality Oral History Project. Today is June 29th and we are in the Special Collections Department at the Georgia State University Library. So I am very excited to be talking to you today, Greg. Oh, um, to be here. And today we are going to really focus on your work with um, publications and the, and the importance <coughs> of these publications in um, LGBTQ life in Atlanta. Um, and I'm going to start from like the, the earliest one sure. that, that uh, you gave me information about, um, and that's the Cruise Magazine. So uh, let's talk about Cruise Magazine. I think you were you worked with Cruise from 1978 to 1984. Correct. Is that correct? Okay. So you were hired by Bob Swindon. Can you talk to me about Bob Swindon? Bob Swindon, um, incredible man, uh, extraordinary personality, and um, more than just pop, more than a little popular. Bob um, was part of a uh, network of national gay publishers, and he um, founded Cruise Magazine and opened up basically Atlanta as the hub for the gay network. That was a weekly publication that was distributed here, digest size, and a national eight and a half by 11 magazine monthly publication that was sent out to 21 cities, as best I can, 21 cities approximately. <clears throat> When you say digest size, tell me what that means. Digest size is your program's playbill size yeah, magazine. Absolutely. Yeah, we're talking, this is digest size. Okay. And then the app 8.5 by 11 is considered magazine. Okay. And, and, and um, even though they both are, in <laughs> definition, a magazine. But Cruz provided the national publication. Obviously, it was a collaboration of different publishers and with several other magazines around the country that were local based. And in particular, there were eight different cities that provided articles, information, so forth and so on. And they had some agent, several agencies that provided national information. <clears throat> some of the information that went into Cruise Matt Cruise's national magazine, for example, was information that was um, not always about the gay scene, but maybe it would be something a little bit about po political or something about uh, health issues that would be important to. The Cruz uh, local publication obviously had more of a local focus, uh, with it being more about the bars and the people here and things like that. So the people who were um, sort of providing content for the national publication. Mm -hmm. Was that all being directed to Atlanta? Correct. And then, then then it would be published in Atlanta and then sent out? Atlanta was the hub. Okay. Um, the Atlanta was the hub for the only thing that was different was that Bob had uh, an associate that was in Dallas that um, did a lot of the actual production. The actual production of the magazine took place there, whereas the Digest size, <coughs> Cruise Weekly, which was Atlanta-based, was printed here. Okay. <coughs> so that was the only difference with that. And the National Magazine was a was huge hit. I remember going uh, to New York and Greenwich Village. You know, it was about 80, 81, and there on a rack, out on the street, Greenwich Village was Cruise National. So can you tell me, the, the, you, you said they were out on a rack in the street. Mm -hmm. Was this a free publication then? The, no. The National Magazine was cost like two bucks. You purchased it. Okay. What about the... the it was given out free. The local, the, the, the local cruise magazine was given out for free. And it was available, uh, they, it, just like now, either on the racks or in, the, you know, in bars or different locations and whatever. Quite a few locations, as a matter of fact. It was, they had Cruise in Atlanta, the Cruise Magazine, I remember distinctly was available in 80 locations. Which to me, just, yeah, I did the eyebrow raising too when I went, 80 locations. Pretty much all of the advertisers took it, but also there would be Dunkin' Dine on Cheshire Bridge. You know, there, you have to realize 
wasn't just a gay bar or whatever. It was if you were within that neighborhood or whatever, and your clientele base was that, then you went with it. And uh, it, was, it, it was just absolutely, and in my first days, I remembered being absolutely amazed at the phone ringing and people going, what well, can we can we get your magazine? Asking to have it, you know, um, just everything from, and one of the biggies for us was the Starbucks at Lenox Mall. <clears throat> Called and asked to have the publication and we weren't distributing in Lenox Mall at all. And the first cruise magazines to be distributed in Lenox was because the Starbucks called and said, what would it take to get your publication? That was the actual question. And um, I filled in that phone call. Yes. And then from there, of course, as you know how it works, once Starbucks got it, then Borders wants the books, and then we're doing it over here, and then here we go. And then they set up a concierge desk, and Cruise Magazine was in there, out in the lobby at Lenox Mall. Interesting. And so if, if you're providing this this magazine for free, mm -hmm. then surely you're having to get lots of advertising yeah. to make that. Yeah, <clears throat> the work. ad base was a huge, is the motivation, totally. Um, the, I was part of the ad team, and um, my orientation, uh, courtesy of Bob Swindon, just uh, irreplaceable. This guy's gift for um, learning to network with people personally. Uh, when you talk to someone, talk to their eyes. Um, make sure you understand that what you have to offer is a quality network for what they have to offer with the community that they want. Understand that, whatever. And the very first days that I was working with him, I was not allowed to do anything other than ride around with him as I met the owners of the organizations and whatever, go to the places where the publication is. Here is the list from the printer telling you how many books we print, the bill, so that you know that that's the truth. Make sure that you understand that these people need us because whatever and whatever. I remembered getting um, from him testimonials from advertising clients on why they advertised in Cruise Magazine. And having those written down and so forth and so on so that whenever I went to talk with someone, I would explain to them what it is we have to do and so forth and so on. And, oh, by the way, that's my opinion, and I think we'd be great for you. But if you would like to hear from some other folks that are spending the money on whatever, here's a list of 25 of them. I think you recognize Back Street, The Cove, yada, 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 yada. The realtors, the restaurants, so forth and so on. Yeah, that's going to be exactly like two questions. What, what was it that people liked about, <clears throat> about sure. advertising? Um, and then who, like, that you've said that there's there's realtors and mm -hmm. I want to know the more mix. about who's, who's who's advertising and and and, as, and as we have this conversation, that's going to change with the different yeah. publications. But the the big thing with um, the want was in that day and time, the community was so different as far as its needs and wants and what cruise that cruise Atlanta as opposed to cruise national, but cruise Atlanta provided was information mostly on entertainment. That was the bulk, uh, because Atlanta had a lot. And, as I might have to say at this point, one of the other things was not all of the entertainment, majority, but not all of the entertainment, was gay-oriented. A lot of it was, the, of course, the restaurants and stuff and things like that, but we had movie theaters running ads. We had whatever. But the bulk of the information was where to go and what to do you know, to have a good time. Uh, the focus was uh, more strongly towards the gay male base because that was the constituency, uh, but women were featured in it, very, very much so. Um, the, and, um, and then one of the things that I found uh, were basically the bread and butter for was the gay bars. Because you're talking about early 70s, uh, late 70s, early 80s, because I got here in 78 but uh, in the fall of, and pretty much went to work. My first issue that I had anything to do with came out for New Year's with, with, with Cruise Magazine. 
Uh, so I went through the orientation and met all the folks and he took me to the very top. I started by meeting Carmine Vera that owned Backstreet, you know, Lord Russell, The Cove, and all these were the largest, these were the most, I mean, line out the door, you know, organizations. And, uh, and if you were gay anywhere in the United States and outside of, you came to Atlanta, that's where you were going because of the view on that. And they were also, these, especially Backstreet, were, were, uh, were bars that were not 100% gay, <clears throat> you know, but they were the 24-hour stuff. Like that. So you got this job like whenever you arrived in Atlanta, pretty much. I did. I was here. Uh, I moved here in August, uh, October the 16th, October the 6th, uh, 1978. Uh, my partner and I did, and I had met Lisa King. She was phenomenal. Uh, she was incredible, legend, drag legend. Uh, God rest her. And she performed with the Sweet Gum Head. And we would come down to visit Atlanta and go to the Sweet Gunhead and so forth and so on. And in going to, and I met her. And then when I said I was coming down to visit, we're looking at possibly coming to be here. She said, "We'll stay with me." <clears throat> so then we came down. And we stayed with her. In my going to the Sweet Gunhead, I met the manager of the Sweet Gunhead, who was John Austin. And on one of my visits, I think it was the second week I was here, I moved here to live. I was living here now. And I went in with uh, Lisa's clothes was my thing. I'd go in with her stuff that she was gonna perform in that night before whatever. And went in, and as I walked in, I said hi to John, yada, yada, yada. And he then goes, Greg, I'd like for you to meet someone. This is Bob Swindon. He works with Cruise Magazine. And I remember, I'll never forget that he works with Cruise Magazine. And my first question was, hi, not a pleasure. Nice to meet you very, very much. And what's your position? <laughs> And he proceeded to look at me and go, I signed the checks. <laughs> Those were the words. I've always felt like I should print a t-shirt with that on it. So from that, I was then, and then he and John had had conversations about me. And it wasn't exclusively the reason he was there, but I was one of the reasons he had come to Cheshire Bridge and had come to the Sweet Gummit was that, and also to pick up their hand and some other stuff and whatever. But he knew I was coming. At that point, how long had Cruz been in publication? Uh, eight years. Okay. Eight years for Atlanta. Atlanta was before National. The National publication, about four or five. And how long did they continue to, to, to publish? Cruise Magazine? Cruise Magazine went on till... Cruise Magazine uh, closed its doors in 86. 80, 86. That's still a pretty good run yeah. for, for um, a magazine. It was. But, and, uh, and they went on three years after Bob's passing. Because when Bob passed, it's when I left. Um, he passed, and I left. So, so can you tell me a bit more about Bob? Bob, Bob had worked. Uh, yeah, Bob was from Dallas originally. Uh, he, was, uh, he had uh, several businesses. As a matter of fact, it was midway through my working at Cruise that I found out that he something he shut something he closed one of his uh, catering businesses, and I thought you had a catering business. I never knew. He had a catering business. Um, they in his home, which ironically he I wound up literally moving years later to across the street from where he lived, down by the Silver Grill on Monroe Drive. There's these condo like. Apartments, very nice, very plush, just up the road going towards Ponce, literally just a block up from the Silver Grill. And in it, he had um, Jim Heverly, who was uh, Jim Teague, I'm sorry, who was our photographer. Jim Heverly was our co editor, was editor of the magazine, the Joe to Bob's publisher. Um, he had a photo studio, had a photography studio there, and Jim was taking, was, uh, it was that they ran a business out of, and the boy next door, um, several of the bars, Teas and Things, which was across from uh, where Bulldogs is now on Peachtree Street, uh, that Tom Galley owned. Um, and it was a Teas and Things, you got t-shirts and posters and stuff like that. Um, anyway, these were clients that would uh, have photo shoots there, but that them and as well as sports organization, yada yada, or if you just wanted to have a photo made, a lot of people went in and got their headshots done there. So Bob had a catering business. He had a photo studio lounge going on, and 
I'm forgetting something, but there was something. Oh, he rented. He had he had these um, uh, <clears throat> rental properties, but they were completely it was if you were visiting. So it was like a guest house kind of thing that you're coming in town to stay and whatever like that. And so then you can just go and rent the place and it's completely furnished and yada yada. So then I was there a couple of years to then him go, well, I'm just going to be a manager of cruise for now. And I'm like, what? what? <laughs> you know? But he was just that, just an amazing ball of energy, very, and, he, and I mean, I have been around him in some situations that were just very tense and anybody else would have lost it or run away or had a heart attack and whatever. And Bob, the calmest, five foot four in the room. Yeah, it was just amazingly short. I'll never forget how he would have me walk in because I'm six foot nine. He'd have me walk in and he'd be behind me <laughs> and then he would step around me and do his, and just in case you thought I wasn't here, that's Bob Smith. Extraordinary personality, very professional, very driven, and in the midst of, and I learned this from him, and I thank you for it, Bob, in the midst of anything else that's going on, he was still focused on the reason he was there, still there on it and whatever. And out of many publishers that I worked with or have known and whatever, I have to say, his care about, if you were a client of his, he cared about you. He'd be the one to call you and say, you know, uh, I'll never forget him calling um, uh, Ray uh, at the um, Illusions and saying, you're gonna have, you're gonna have, Bertha Butts is getting ready to have a birthday. Why don't we do a piece on her or maybe do something, are you gonna have a birthday party? They go, well, we didn't have this. Uh, you know, why don't we do this? We could promote it and we could invite all the other drag queens and all the hello. You know, when he would turn this little, this person's birthday into this event where, you know, they're having to tell folks to leave at four o'clock in the morning because we don't have an after hours license or something. That's more than proactive. Yeah. And, and it's something that, other than the fact that they just, you know, will love him for doing it, he's not making anything off of it other than the fact that he's just done a perk for a client. And um, where were the offices? On Juniper, <coughs> Piedmont Park, Juniper, uh, on Juniper, uh, uh, six and Juniper. You're heading towards downtown, you know what I'm saying? Piedmont's right this way, you're mm -hmm. six and Juniper in this, in one of the, that whole neighborhood, it's not the same now, but in the big trees, which of course at that day and time was major day. Just, I mean, if you were straight, that was unique. And um, were all of the people who worked for the magazine were they a gay? Everybody except Nita. Okay. Can you tell me, like, who the staff were? <clears throat> oh, absolutely. Um, Pat Coleman and I did the advertising. Pat Coleman, Jim Heverly was the, he was Bob's assistant. He ran the office. Jim was in charge of, uh, Jim did the graphics. You know, back then it was paste up. You know, you did paste up today. Of course, it's all digital, but it was paste up. There were no computers. Um, and uh, yeah, I know, just don't shut down, it's true. Uh, it wasn't Flintstones, but there were no computers. Um, and, uh, and of course, later Jim and Pat would move on to create, et cetera, a magazine. Um, Jim Teague, the other Jim, Jim Teague was the photographer. And I was, uh, so I worked a lot with Jim because we'd go out at the bars in the evening. And part of it was Bob's idea was to help me keep getting oriented with people <clears throat> and meeting folks and whatever. And the fact that I'm six foot nine, if there's a crowd, give Rick the camera and he can just whatever. <clears throat> to this day, I am pretty good with a camera. I, it's amazing how many situations, you know, parades, okay. Once again, being six foot nine, just get in the camera. <laughs> and uh, pride parades in particular, I was a hit. Um, and so, and then there was Linda Sanford. Linda Sanford. She was, uh, she was bookkeeper. And she was, she was straight. Uh, had a wonderful husband <clears throat> who was a police officer uh, Fulton County. And, um, and then we had the distribution guys, and then there was Tim Rollis. Tim Rollis was an office person, and Ray Kluka, ah, 
who went on to have his own magazine and did a lot of writing. And, and that was his thing. Oh, gosh, Ray Kluka. I almost forgot Ray Kluka. Ray Kluka was the editor. <clears throat> but Ray, Ray, didn't, Ray worked for Cruz, but he didn't just work for Cruz. And um, it actually was via Ray that I realized you didn't have to have one paycheck. And as you have known, I diversified myself by later on. But um, Ray did a lot of the articles. And, um, and then, of course, on top of that, you have contributing writers. So that's how a lot of the other stuff came in. But one of the things with Cruise Magazine that is, was very unique, as opposed to the other publications I worked with and even became more aware of the industry, was the fact that a lot of the stuff was what the clients are doing. <clears throat> we didn't do a lot of things if you weren't a client. And God help you and may you rest in hell if you made the list. People have a blacklist. Bob had the list. And it was on the back of the bathroom door and it had a star with the list in it. And literally they would he'd just do it on this, type it on this thing and put it on a label thing and it went up in there and it was under glass and that was it. <clears throat> These were organizations, sometimes people, mostly organizations that we do not, we will not, we cannot, we won't. Is there, was there a reason why? Like what, something they had done. They had there done. was a couple of them that, that was justified. And to be honest with you, you know, uh, I run a business now and you have those folks because they've done something bad to you. They ripped you off. Uh, they lied to you. Uh, they've done something that's that's tried to harm you or your business or those that are the foundation of you. Uh, again, it gets back to that whole professional business thing where you respect and look after your foundation. These are the people that support you and you know allow you to buy that loaf of bread. If this is someone that's got their hand in the cart and are trying to undermine you and take away the foundation and deny you that loaf of bread, then probably we should just pretend like they don't exist. Fair enough. And that's just professional, I think. Now, you were their first African-American. Uh, Correct. Employee. Was that challenging, or, or was it an easy? I, it, it was interesting, because what I did find out was I was the only African-American employee for any gay magazine in Atlanta, Georgia, period. And that part really kind of shocked me. The only other ones that I did know that worked for publications did something like a, a distribution of books. I have to give that. That was there was there was that would go and put out the books, or, or work with, um, or clean the office. And I I really remembered being just. I said that to Bob, and the, this was in the first. I don't think I was there a week before he mentioned it to me. And uh, Teague told me he goes, you know, you're the first black guy to work as a, uh, he says, you're a staff member sales rep on the paycheck hoo-ha, and he goes, whatever, and he goes, and Bob's really putting you out there. I mean, even as much as us having communicated with a couple of the clubs where um, African-American patrons trying to get in the bar were asked for an extra ID, and we were, he took me and introduced me to two of the owners of, refused to talk to the manager, I want hootie hoo, and uh, it was Backstreet in the Armory. Backstreet in the Armory, most heavily Backstreet, would ask you for a second ID if you were black trying to come in. And, uh, and Bob took me over and I met with um, owner Backstreet, Carmine Vera, and I met with uh, the Colonel, Bill Copeland, at the Armory. And in both situations we were told, they were, you know, we had a conversation about the fact that I was not to be asked for an ID, second ID, Matter of fact, this is Greg. He works with us. You've met him. Tell your person who this is. He probably shouldn't have to pull out his ID at all because this is Greg. It's not hard to forget him. Hello, you know. And if that's the case, probably you should probably hire a new doorman. And um, and Bob took it further and said, oh, and also if he has any friends with him, that same scenario goes for them. And if you have a problem with that, those rates you've enjoyed, you might want to put your head between your legs. 
kiss did, them goodbye. Did you personally, in any other places, have problems with this 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 sort of double uh -uh. thing? Uh uh. Okay. No, I don't. I don't. I none. The only time no. Mm -mm. And it was and even after that communicate even after those conversations, I had, there was a couple of times I did. I had twice I did at Backstreet. Even after that, and I I left it alone. Uh, they. I just went, Greg Darty and I work for, you know, the Cruise Magazine, and I pulled out my business card, and they just kind of went. And then I remembered he got up and went and had to go chat with somebody, and then the manager, and then here comes Mike Wolf at the door, just going, Greg, mm -hmm. you know. <clears throat> so it was just a thing, you know. But that was, um, and it was really unusual because you just asked the question, do you ever have that? And, and no, you, you, there was no other situation with that. There were so many. The other clubs were very mixed racially, very, you know, you had some where you didn't have maybe so much, but, you know, it was just a lot, a very, it was just that. And I remembered one other club, there was a slight issue for a minute, Far Library. After a minute, they had an issue about the, the card thing, and then they, and they undid it. It was right when I was here in the beginning. They, they somebody told me that they had asked. They would ask for you know the card and whatever and all like that, and then they got over it because, and then I never had a problem because in the the first couple of times I went, I was with Teague and we were there to take pictures. We were working, you know, and it was you know. And so then they once again got it. Him and Teague. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, I want you to talk me through what a normal, oh, I, if there was such a thing as a normal day for you, like what your like day to day, what you, you get to, to, like what did your work day look like? Depends on the schedule. Um, if we were, because it could go from me making sales calls to me making, literally going and visiting someone and whatever and chatting with them about stuff. Or it was me doing some of the company errands kind of stuff. Or, and this happened, a good portion of my week was working in the office. <clears throat> and I would be doing everything from making sure the worksheet has everything in and we've logged in. So we're doing an article and an ad and so forth on illusions and so forth and so on and all like this and whatever. Filing, you know, because once again, we weren't on, we didn't have computers. So it was, you know, just Flintstones. And so, so you, so you have that. Um, the, the introduction to people thing was never ending. That communication thing, once again, wasn't a whole lot of email. What? So if you're gonna get out there and be seen and whatever, we had to go. So a lot of times we had, and this was, and there was, there was a schedule in the art room, and it was who was doing what and going with who and whatever you're gonna do. And so then I would just, you know, be assigned to, or Bob would quiz me on, and usually that was a conversation you had the day before for tomorrow, uh, but there was a weekly itinerary. And by weekly, it can include Saturday and Sunday. You know, that, that, that's, that's not, you know, that doesn't, that means nothing. Maybe you don't, we, may, we may not be going to the office, on Saturday and Sunday, it was really something there from there, whatever. But in my case, I really liked my running with Teague. It was, I, it, I really liked it. So why did, they, why did they pair you together? I think it had a lot to do with the fact of me and Teague just clicking. We clicked immediately. And, um, and I got a tremendous interest in that camera. I got a tremendous, in, in, you know, in, I felt so much that what the publication did, because if you look, if you look through the books, there's just a plethora of photos, and he was good at getting that photo that would give you uh, motivation for a comment, motivation for a conversation. He was good at getting that photo, that image, that face, that side, be it the shot of a drag queen in the midst of a, just an emotional whatever, to that perfect shot of the stripper, yay, here we go, you know, all of that, or conversation or whatever, and faces and people. And then one of the things when we would go out, that he would, a lot of times, he would, I never forget, this was the, like the second week I was working, he would have me look at the photos of the people, and I remember I had this magazine, and I wrote their names, 
and whatever. Then when we would go there to these places, he'd have me, because once again, I'm the tallest person in the room most of the time, um, find them. So if I want Tiffany Ariadis, Lisa King, I want you to find Charlie up. If you see them, whatever. If they're standing around talking or whatever, whatever, whatever. Then I, a lot of times, would be the one that would come up. Charlie, how are you doing? Bless your heart, it's so wonderful. Can we get a shot of you at the bar, yakking with your friends, whatever? Or even a lot of times I would set up things where here's celebrity hot bartender that's yada, yada, yada. And we've got Charlie, and we've got these folks. And then I had to do this whole thing with going, is it okay if we take your picture? Because yada, 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 yada. You're going to be in a gay magazine and your mama's going to know. So. And um, I love doing that. I love doing that. And so I got to where I did that, and then I did it a couple of times, and it got back to Bob, to where Bob then went, so you have uh, the knack for it. And I did it, I wound up doing it all the way through to going into my own business. When I was, you know, doing more stuff that was more theater oriented. You know, I just, because I, I love the arts. So, somebody who's like, very recently arrived in Atlanta, I assume this was a great way to get to know Big time. the community just generally, Big time. the drag queens, the yeah, people yeah. in the bars, all of that stuff. My first friends were Lisa King, Charlie Brown, uh, Tiffany Ariagas, who didn't live here. She's from Florida, but she'd come up and perform. And I wound up knowing her all the way into 2000 and hoo-ha when I was going to Florida playing softball and I'd run into her again. Um, but yeah, a lot of that, and male lead guys, because back then we had lots of those, which we did RC Cola, um, you know, Ron Ellis, just tremendous amount of that. And and in many cases, um, I would do these, we do these photo shoots. So you'd have all these models and stuff and whatever like that. I mean, we had this photo shoot in the middle of, there was a, uh, uh, there was a hotel, it was an apartment complex on Crescent, um, the back road, and it had a swimming pool in the middle. And it was to do a, um, a photo shoot for Bailey Tyre. And Charlie Brown was the main whatever. Charlie Brown and six guys in their thongs. And so we're back there and so whatever. And so my job was to just kind of, after I got this orientation from Teague and from Bob on what we're going to do. So I'm like, okay, we need to move this around, whatever. We're going to put a raft in here and you guys are going to whatever. Now Charlie, I need you to rescue the guy, whatever, like that. Okay, good, well, let's do it now. And... So learning how to just kind of do that and, and just getting that feel for things. Now, all of a sudden, because we've had this photo shoot, well, it's five guys, it's Clay, it was Roy Rocks, Roy, 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 Roy Baum, who works at Rocks, right now, the restaurant on Cheshire Bridge, whom I see about every month when my buddy and I go there. And so, that yeah, my first friends were the people from the bar. I mean, the bartenders, the managers, and uh, all of that. And that's who knew me, you know, right off the bat. And my, my husband worked, um, he had two jobs, actually. He was a part-time handyman person, and he worked for a vet. He was, he worked with veterinarians when we were in Raleigh, and, and he did, but then he moved here. But he was also real good at fixing your plumbing, and you in the bathroom, and whatever like that, and whatever, so that kind of stuff. So whenever we go places and do things, and of course it was, he liked that because these introductions there, and I go, well, yeah, and if you knew this, whatever, well, John would be glad to help you with it. And so he goes, so all of our friends work in the bars. So that's, yes. a, that's a great introduction to Atlanta. It, it really <laughs> is, and very different. <laughs> and a lot of people go, so you did the average person? I know. <laughs> I didn't. Um, so now, you, can you hazard a guess as to how many? Um, Organizations or people place ads with, with crews? Mm, that would be difficult. Uh, uh, that would be a little difficult. It was like a 64 page magazine, but now there's maps and things and whatever. <clears throat> That's That would be a little difficult. You said it was like bars. It was bars, it was restaurants, uh, motels. Uh, it was interesting the range of, of, of businesses that did do that. Um, <clears throat> you would have, you would definitely have ads for uh, performances, different events and things like that. Um, you know, legitimate shows kind of stuff. Um, and, but it, but, mm, you know, it was just, um, it was quite a range, just a real range. Yeah, a lot of, I remembered a lot of things that would happen in Piedmont Park. 
um, you know, uh, be their concerts, or that they would, they kind of, I guess, would want to see some sort of a draw towards, you know, the gay community. It was pretty diverse, though, as opposed to the other magazines I worked for. It was very, it was very diverse, because that diversity, none of the others did it. None of the other magazines that I worked with, you know, did the diversity that they did. Um, uh, the Cabana Hotel, Doris um, <coughs> Day's Hotel that was across the street from where the back street uh, was, uh, that kind of thing, they motivated that. There were lots, lots of galleries. I just thought about that. There were lots of galleries, none of them big, none of them big. There were several tucked away behind the bar on Peachtree, once again back on Crescent. Um, <clears throat> there was the strip, and there was, there was several galleries stuck in this building that had been something before, you know, the thing. They, they take it over and it becomes a nonprofit y kind of thing. Several, several galleries there. Um, um, the painter, uh, photographer, I believe he was an artist, he did multiple things. Tim Burns, he was extraordinary. He had um, an exhibit there, uh, he had a gallery there. He and Mark Vance, Mark Vance was an incredible abstract artist. Just phenomenal. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, there was a mix. <clears throat> Who was reading the magazine? <clears throat> um, I I would well obviously I think the predominantly of what the age range and everything was really wide because I don't think so much of your older gay were so much there with it, except for the fact it kept them aware, because there wasn't really a whole lot of other resources. Um, <clears throat> but the one thing that I think was very interesting was the fact that with all this bar and where to go and what to do, and the fact that Atlanta had a couple of 24-hour clubs, that made for a really different, you know, agenda, mindset. And you had this, this extraordinary uh, input of tourism. I mean, and we still do, but I, it's nothing like it was then. And what was my monitor of our tourism was my first pride. I, and it got larger and larger and larger. Right about when we got to the mid 80s, <clears throat> 84s, whatever, mid 80s, they, I was shocked, you know. I remember I was part of the Pride Committee. Donna Narducci was our Pride Director. Uh, I did the Pride Guide. I did some work with some of the promotional things, getting folks to just come in and stuff like that. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, 350,000 people was, we participated. And I remember the big thing, it was us in Chicago <laughs> trying to beat each other. And, um, but, but to answer your question, the point was is that Atlanta's tourism was just amazing. I mean, and, and again, not just from folks in this country. I mean, it was amazing the people I would run into and meet and so forth and so on or whatever. A lot of them calling crews and me answering the phone and them going, how do we get information on whatever, whatever. We're at the Marriott and we're here from, you know, we're from London and we're queer and what do we do? And of course we didn't do queer back then. But, um, <laughs> but um, it, so, so when you asked about who the base was, uh, the age wise was pretty broad. Because you had everything from the stuff that, if you're legal to get in, or just under, because <clears throat> in many places, you know, wasn't so much checking, you just walk in. And, um, and then those places that were older and whatever. And the diversity be the bear crowd or, you know, or be just into the, you know, the drag thing or, the, you know, you, this, it's, remember it was the disco era. So you're gonna go dance, whatever like that. And, uh, and I had a chance to go and visit several of, you know, the, the black clubs, African-American clubs, um, <clears throat> back in that time. And there were, and it was, it was very different because they were sort of removed except for that 668, 688, I think it's 688. It was on um, where the Varsity is on Spring Street and you come up a bit and it was right in there. 
and um, uh, that was the only, to me, in Midtown of the African American gay bars. The other two I knew were Tracks was downtown, and uh, and I became very in their world also with softball. Um, I was impressed with Tracks. I was just I was really impressed with Tracks because I really expected. But it was really nice, DJs friendly, wonderful energy, um, you know, disco, disco, disco. You came in in the mirror balls, hitting it, and uh, but really a nice ball. <clears throat> what other publications were around at that time in Atlanta? Do you remember? Hmm. Um, David was here. Uh, David was Florida based. And there were several publications that had come that were Florida-based that involved uh, Atlanta, um, <clears throat> and because, mainly because of the fact that in, in Florida there were multiple cities. You had multiple gay cities. Um, Atlanta was the largest. Obviously, we were prominent in Georgia, but in Florida you had multiple cities that also could offer you the same, you know, close to size and diversity. Um, <clears throat> probably the other competition we would have would maybe be Orlando or Miami. Um, but David was here, and um, David was a very different publication. It was just a black and white, also digest size. Um, uh, Alan Redford was the um, Atlanta-based publisher of David Magazine. Um, David was a split magazine. <clears throat> Half the book was about Atlanta, and half the book was about Florida. Um, and when you went to Florida, you got, the only thing that changed was the cover. They would change the cover and shift the copy to which, much later being in the printing industry, I learned, that's a nightmare for your graphic person. And so, why don't you just make another magazine and make it just what you want? So, but, but they would include Atlanta information. Um, and we had quite a crossover of visiting back and forth between, um, heavily with the uh, Tampa St. Pete. Tampa St. Pete and Atlanta were very on it. Where, where was <clears throat> David based in Florida? Was David Magazine was based in, it was Fort Lauderdale. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was in Tampa. I'm sorry, guess it was. It was in Tampa, and specifically, it was in Ybor City, near the Copa, the big gay bar there, where Tiffany Ariana's performed. <clears throat> well, let's talk about David, because that's where you went to. Yeah. But, but before we do that, you, you, let's talk about why you went, like why you left Cruz and went. To Bob passed away. Bob Swindon passed away. It was in March of. Uh, it was in March of 84, yeah, and uh, he passed away. He was, uh, he'd been sick for a while, and, uh, and he, I knew we were losing him. And um, <clears throat> he, um, he'd been going and getting some treatments and things in Dallas and back and forth and whatever. And I, and my leaving was planned and all of that. And uh, so um, when he did that, then I decided I would like to go and work in theater. And I'd been offered um, a job for an interview at the Academy Theater, which was, um, uh, the office was on Peachtree Street uh, in the uh, Marquee Theater. It's the actual theater where Margaret Mitchell walked out and was crossing the street and was killed. <clears throat> the actual theater had become uh, the actual movie theater, which became the offices and performance space for the Academy Theater. Um, and I went to work with Frank Quittau, who is the artistic director, executive the artistic director for the Academy Theater. Um, and during that time, I had met Alan a couple of times, <laughs> Redford, uh, the publisher of David, who had it was asking me if I would like to um, work with them, and I what I did what I did was is that I got a job in the marketing department for the in the Academy Theater, 
uh, which I'm just thrilled. And to this day, still working with folks, Kenny Leon, who uh, owns, created Kenny Leon's True Colors Theater, still working with him. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do an article on him in our next issue, yada, yada, yada. But um, a lot of what I learned from Bob had focused me on expanding myself into marketing. And it goes back to that very first comment we were talking about, where you focus on the concept. Don't just go in there to sell an ad. Yes, it's the motivation if you're going to keep gas in the car, but at the same time, there's other things you have to do. Provide a service, educate yourself about the things and whatever in the market and where you're going, and become a part of it. Don't just become it, become a part of it. And that was kind of what I did, and I went in. And um, so in working with David Magazine, what I did <clears throat> initially was there was several clients, more than a few, that I had had from Cruise Magazine that had become attached to me. And even after Cruise and David and beyond, they stayed with me. Um, <clears throat> and um, so in my going to work with David Magazine, which I only would go for like a day or so, you know, hit and run, whatever like that, because I had a job job. Um, I was able to bring my clients into David and do their ad, do ads with them. And then I actually, and I only did it once, um, I wrote the first article I wrote that I actually put in Pulse magazine. And it was me doing a piece, uh, it was called Under the Lights, and it was me doing a piece on theater, Atlanta theater, for the gay community. And Alan thought it was a good idea. He wasn't real crazy about it because it wasn't super gay. Because I was talking about what I was doing, what I did was, what I was doing was, was I was promoting the Academy Theater shows in this, mag in this magazine. So I did Under the Lights. The uh, extraordinarily wonderful publisher for Pulse, Ken Store, said to me, why don't you do that for us, expand it a little bit uh, there, and you don't have to be contributing. I thought, you mean I don't have to be contributing? And he went, capiche. <laughs> and um, so, I, I began to do, so I would write pieces on different things and different arts groups and different stories and whatever like that and whatever. And I, one of the things it was with David was is it was a test to see if his client base would be interested in theater, going to shows and stuff like that. Um, he thought so, but he was, he, um, he had Atlanta's, you know, David Magazine, but he did have a superior boss, and Florida did not think it was a good idea. So I literally gave them two, I was in two issues, and was told no, and he goes, they don't want you to, no, they just want you to bring ads, and I went, not a problem, we each have bank accounts, that'll be fine. But Pulse took the reverse, because I told Ken what happened, and so then he just said, go for it, please expand it, and so then I became a staff writer while working at the Academy Theater in the marketing department. That's awesome. Um, so let's talk about, because I'm like, I'm looking at this. Um, yeah, Pulse is 1984 to 86. Mm -hmm. And then let's talk about Pulse then. Oh, I'm um, multitasking. You're like, you're. Yeah, it was crazy. What I'm seeing though is a really interesting, you, I'm actually beginning to see your transition into to like, the, like how theater is, is right. in the arts. Right. It's like you're, find, you're really beginning to find your name. Well, the seed got planted, and I didn't say this, but before I moved to Atlanta, I worked for the Raleigh Little Theater. Mm. Um, and, but there, what I did was, is I volunteered as a house manager, and uh, because it, and there was this attraction to the performing arts. I mean, even my friends would go, sure, they don't pay you. I went, no, I know, I just go through the show, I want to help, and I put out the books, and then we chit chat, and whatever, and then I leave. And, it's, and um, yeah, the performing arts always had my attention, always. I always had a thing about the arts, um, even with the fact that I was an art teacher. You know, 
cool, cool colors, lines, planes, eighth graders learning beginning art. I always had a thing. Yes, that was visual arts, and yes, this is performing arts, but to me, it's art. Mm -hmm. It's a creative. It's a creative outlet. Mm -hmm. So, with the um, we were talking about Pulse. Mm -hmm. The thing with Pulse, Pulse magazine. Pulse magazine was huge eye opener to me because it was just different. You know, I worked for crews where it was drag, it was naked men, it was whatever. And, you saw the magazines. A lot of people that see those old magazines today are just shocked. They're going, you can see this guy's butt. And I went, yeah. you should have been at the filming session where everything else was edited, at, edited out. Um, yeah, it was just very, very naked. Pulse magazine really, really, really had a great focus on editorial information, education, you know, beyond just getting you to the bar and whatever. We had, and he brought in some incredible article, people contributing writers. John Greenwell, who was Rachel Wells, iconic drag queen at the Sweet Gum Head, just wrote, as a matter of fact, just published her memoirs uh, in February of this year, which are like, you know, if you can find a copy somewhere, good luck. Um, extraordinary person that I met, extraordinary person to do with, School teacher in Chicago had a school teacher's license, moved to Atlanta, performed, decided, eh, back to Chicago, went back to Chicago, became the superintendent of schools, and just wrote memoirs. I'm like, we need a movie. Um, but he was he wrote in Pulse and uh, with the photo up and his name of his piece there in Rachel Wells, you know, fabulous, always fabulous looking, and um, it was six three. Um, you know, and, but there were the, but the writers in Pulse were very strong. And one of the things was is that in the pieces that were in there, you got insights. So John's piece was about how he felt about something that was going on and whatever, 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 whatever. So for the first time, you had views that could take you into politics, could be could take you into what's going on and whatever, could take you into lifestyle things that are happening around you and whatever. Um, Charlie Brown had an article. And then you got off into sports. Pulse was where I learned much more about Atlanta's gay sports scene. Because here comes softball. Here comes the fact we had Dixie Bowling League. Uh, we had a we had a we had a, a volleyball group that that played against teams from Amsterdam and Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And you're going really gay golfers. Hello at the Country Club of the South. I think they couldn't tell anybody they were gay because, yeah, anyway. But um, Pulse was just this expanse. So then all of a sudden, the menu really broadened. I'm not so much into hoping to get you on a bar stool or to, you know, to have a drink or whatever or, you know, whatever. Uh, this is to educate you and to, you know, really tell you about stuff. B books. They would have at least one or two folks in there that wrote books, or Bill Bagwell, whom I will work with much later, I met him then. He was a playwright. He also was the editor of Guide Magazine. Um, but he was a playwright. He wrote several plays. One of his pieces even wound up going on tour. It's called Camp. And um, which had nothing to do with the movie, but he was, they actually had him reference he came and chatted with. Um, so that kind of stuff. With, so if it's, it is more, um, if it's not as focused on getting bums on seats in bars, Correct. Uh, do people have to pay for that? Mm -mm. So it was a free, it was a free so magazine. How did, they, how did they afford to? A free to magazine. Ads. It was still full of ads. It's just your advertisers were not it was interesting, and the ads weren't cheap. Um, it was interesting how they had an ad base, and this is where I learned about getting someone to buy a package of, just like I do now. I have a season advertiser, and you sign up for all, and you get a better deal. That also now gives us a financial foundation under the house, yeah. And they were the first to, that I, I went, okay, thank you, Ken. And, but, the thing with it was, was the advertiser 
who stuck with fought over being in there because their clientele was older. Their clientele was older. They were not really big with the kids, the 20-something year olds, mm, kind of. But then if you looked at that magazine, you got it. If you looked at the advertiser base for that, but the Far Library demanded that back cover. Would, the word was, what do you want for it? How much? You know, that, that cover, those covers, were, they were the same constantly. There was, um, there was a Far Library, uh, I can't do it now, but I, I remember there was uh, just really unique, it was the first, the Atlanta Botanical Gardens, it was the first time I saw a gay, an ad in a gay publication for the Atlanta Botanical Gardens. The Atlanta Botanical Gardens had one in there. I remembered there was a, um, one of the, the theaters, like Actors Express, theatrical outfit was on Peachtree Street, right next to the bar on Peachtree back then. Ah, uh, bless their hearts. Uh, to this day, we, when we laugh about the fact that they were, you know, sometimes, because you could have a performance, we got weekends where else over here, we got the bar on Peachtree right here, we got illusions right here, and we're trying to have this show. <laughs> and it was like, just turn the music up. So, <laughs> you know, but, but that was the thing, and, and they got their base. It was really different, though. I never thought about it until you mentioned that about how, you know, the focus, if you're the publisher of this publication and you have created this, you know, this spectrum, this thing that you want to do, so you've got to create this conduit that's going to make things come into your world. So how do you make that effective if you're not trying to sell the volume of ads that Cruz did? Because yeah. it was amazing, and it was a thick book, Cruz was. Um, Pulse was a bigger magazine, not quite as thick, but the, the rates were higher, and they got it. I remembered several issues where we had to, in, they were they, I wasn't on, you know, I was only on staff as a writer, but I didn't live in the house, you know, when I, was at, when I was at the theater. But one of the things was is that they would increase the size of the book because they had more people coming into my ads, especially during the holiday. Mm -hmm. You get in towards that holiday or pride, and that book's going to be bigger. Um. Just sort of logistically, um, who, like, where was, where were their offices located? For Pulse, uh -huh. it was in Buckhead, and it was. Is that Farm Road or is that West Paces? I'm going to say West Paces Ferry as you cross Peachtree Street. Mm -hmm. And like in the Buckhead Village. Who were the staff? Ken Store was the publisher, the creator of the book. Um, there was uh, Booster House. Tom Booster House was the editor. He was amazing. And he was amazing. This guy, because, oh, photographer. Well, he was a photographer. He had a couple of gallery exhibits over on what, was, what is now Tula. No, Bennett Street. Tula wasn't there, but you know what I'm talking about. That's always been an artsy hub, and it was in the place where Tula is now. There was a gallery before. And um, uh, speaking of Mark Vance, and then they had several exhibits there. Um, and he was a tremendous fine photographer. Once again, you had a photographer, there was also a photographic artist. So this visual thing was right here. And it was amazing. The photos that I acquired because they didn't meet up to his standards that I wound up putting in that trunk that I drove around for 40 years. A lot of them were photos that he went, oh, that's not, and we would all pick it up, and you'd have like a whole group going, I think it's gorgeous, it's perfect, I don't, whatever. No, I just, I can't possibly. Um, reminds me of, off of Incredibles, the woman that made the uniforms. I don't care about it, it's just, that's it, no, trash. But, um, <laughs> but he was amazing, and, um, Um, there was Dean. Dean did the Dean did some of the graphic works as well. I can't do the right thing. Um, but there was they had a they had Tom multitasked a bunch because Tom would do the photography and he helped with the graphic layout uh, because he was very good at working with the printer. And then Dean helped, and, uh, and then you had a slew of 
contributing writers. I mean, if you look in their staff, who are you got this group of about five people up here, and then there's like 15 names. And um, how often was it published? Uh, Pulse was a, that's a good question. The volume, you had volume and number. And Pulse was, I think Pulse was a monthly. I think it was a monthly. I think. I think it was a monthly. It was a monthly. And was it circulated in the same way as mm -hmm. like the other ones in bars and stuff like it, that? It was. It was one of the, but it went a little differ further. It, you didn't, you could find it like in the galleries and so forth and so on. And it was really buckhead focused. Really much more so. Pulse did this whole thing about let's take it up a notch, let's, let's entertain the upper class, let's be a little bit more so. For example, Elton John on Peachtree Street, right near ooh, that, 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 that cathedral, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's a high rise next door, where he had the top two floors, because he had to have his copter on top. Anyway, and he moved in there, and one of the things that um, encouraged uh, I'll never forget this, this is incredible. One of the things Elton John made known to everybody was is that while he was there, he needed to have a place to pick up Pulse magazine. And four of the shops in the area called and said, what do we need to do to get a display rack here so that we can let Elton know that whatever. But what it helped me understand was is that the distribution for that magazine was really a lot there. Because they didn't have, it was very hard to find out where the book was. I remember that. Even if you look at the copies that I've got, they don't really, and I think, well, you know, if you don't tell them, they won't come. So, um, but it was very buckhead. There, it was, as a matter of fact, Midtown and North, and that was about it. So it's a, 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 a little bit of an older crowd, mm -hmm. but like it's more buckhead focused. The, the articles that were written were the, um, written like <laughs> it was a mix a little bit of a mix a like, little bit more towards education a uh -huh. little bit more education you know a little bit more of this you went to college or you've got a little bit of you know we we're looking for brain cells here uh, we're also looking for taste um, car dealerships the car dealerships came on like crazy with them um, they were one of the ones so like this is one of the first ones to have you know, BMW, Buckhead, or whatever, whatever, whatever. Even though back then, the car to have was a Cadillac. Because that, I remember that. You did, it wasn't so much the little sporty thing as it was the, you know, kind of expensive American. So you didn't have Porsche or BMW or whatever so much as you would have Cadillac and whatever like that and that kind of stuff. Um, but they had a lot of car dealerships. Peasant restaurants. The peasant restaurants focused on them like crazy. Steve Nygren, gosh, these names are coming back. Steve Nygren, the founder of, 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 of the Peasant Restaurants, I did an interview with him, but it was after Pulse, it was for Guy. And in the conversations with him, he kind of talked about the fact that he, there were certain gay publications in the past that he had worked with that he really, he had chances to work with, but he, the only one he really, really liked a whole lot was Pulse. And advertised almost all of his restaurants in, and they were the, they were always that inside back cover, and it would be the peasant restaurant, and it'd be all of them, like the whole page or whatever, because they had something really big in Colony Square, and then there was one very near where Crawford Long, across from Crawford Long, there was the pleasant peasant, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So it's Steve Nygren was the one. So you see, that was the kind of thing. So it was towards the affluent. Gay, and they, they have quite a few for the ladies. Gay was women. the writing still very progressive? Or did, was it sort of, you know? Mm -hmm. I think it depends on the writing, it depends okay. on the who. You had some variety in that. The only thing I can tell you is that um, Kim Store was very tough on what you put and what you did. Uh, I remember with Bob, he kind of got over it. Jim would look at it a little bit. Heavily, and it's with Cruz, and you know, but your articles were. I've heard folks be told, okay, you, know, you, you 
give them they, they give you the article they're going to submit and whatever, and it would come back with some red ink on it with that, you know, that little flash thing, which we all know means edit out. And, um, you know, or there have been folks that have been told, try and turn this around or they get some notes, meaning I don't like your focus. And, yeah. and, if, and if you didn't get it back in by deadline, well, we'll see you next month. So, so were you paid per article or mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I mean you already had another job at this point. Mm -hmm. So I was in the marketing was, department okay. at the Academy Theater and um, <clears throat> and actually met uh, who's actually a best friend now but also uh, Ken McNeil and he uh, he was in the box office at the Academy Theater and he is now the senior box office manager for the Wardrop Art Center and uh, and one of my best pals, <clears throat> and I met him then. He later co-worked with me uh, when I went into business. He was my art director, my first company. So, yeah. Wait, so. Sure. So it, I guess then you're working, <coughs> you're working like, if you're immersed in the arts anyway, you did, did you have to go out and go visit the different theaters or were you writing about specifically what you already for, knew? For Pulse, I wrote, well, no, for God, for David, I wrote exclusively about Academy Theater, okay. which is where I worked. <clears throat> for Pulse, I expanded it. But, if, to be honest with you, um, at the Academy Theater, we did lots of rentals. Folks that would come and perform there, like the Carl Radcliffe Dance Company, whom I did their playbill. And, it was one of the first programs I did, actually. <clears throat> and uh, for a professional company, I did some game theater companies. But the... Um, uh, but we had other folks that would come in and rent the space and whatever like that, so I could do their stuff. But then the Woodruff Art Center's down the street. I'm very involved with that. So we're going to the Symphony, we're going to the Alliance, we're going to see the, you know, whatever, whatever like that. Um, <clears throat> so I would do those. But I, would, I got into getting around, and yes, that's the seed that planted me for the job I'm doing now because it had me going around and going. And because I'm now working with, because we had an ensemble, cast, uh, which I said like to Kenny Leon was in it, Rosemary Newcott, who is the assistant director for the Alliance Theater today, she was in our cast, um, just on and on and on. And so when they would go and do things, because they would go around to shows, with, I'd go with them, you know, and in many cases I drove. <laughs> and, you know, and uh, the joke used to be, well, Greg can drive, that way we can take the bottle of champagne. <laughs> I got that that game too, but but I got to go other places and see things that I remembered. Uh, Horizon Theater, uh, Actors Express, like I mentioned them before, and uh, so so the ones I did go to, I would you know put them you know that's I would mention them in there, but but a lot of it was to highlight where I worked. You know. What a great life you've lived! I mean, that being able to do Crazy. like that that's what you kind of need to do, but it's also mm -hmm. what you want to do anyway. Just, yeah. <laughs> you don't, when you're talking to the guy upstairs, I don't forget to say thank you. Cause it's just like, you know, uh, just a lot of things, just, just to, because of situations you bump into and because of things and I guess the one thing I have to be grateful to is what my parents taught me, is to not, you know, take, don't let it get by you. Take advantage. You know, especially if you've been brought into the situation and someone shaking your hand and smiling at you and oh, by the way, I own, I run, I do whatever, and what can we get you to do with us? Then, you know, provide your information, but at the same time, try to do things that you are capable of. Just stay focused, don't, don't you know, don't put yourself in a situation that's gonna not work out, but you know, put your coins on the table. That's how it seems table. to have worked really well. Yeah. Been very fortunate. Um, it's great. Um, so <coughs> Pulse. You, you were yeah you were at Pulse for eight from eighty four to eighty six. Correct, correct. And then um, you were also in in that time you were also working for Guide Magazine. No, no, um, no. no. Started. Yeah, I started. Well, yeah, I. Yeah, there was a transition. There okay. was a transition year. There was. Um, I went for. I was working at the Academy Theater. And then I was a contributing writer with Pulse. And then I went to work. What, uh, Pulse, 
Pulse went into kind of a real downspan. Um, they lost Ken to the plague. Oh. And then um, I, once again, ran into uh, Don Cundiff, who was with Guide Magazine. Guide had been here, and Guide had already started here. Guide had started here, Guide had been going. Guide was part of a national network, once again, this was another one of those. But um, Guide, uh, Don kind of bought it, bought the rights to, went through the whole legal hoo-ha for two years, and Guide Atlanta was unattached to the National Guide. It did the National Guide for like three or four years, and I was aware of them. Um, crazy about Guide. Uh, Guide also was still, it was like, it was like Pulse. They were broad, wide open, you know, just a lot of information, the writers, whatever. They really encouraged the, in, the intellectual minds and whatever. And that's where I, I uh, one of my uh, bringovers to joining Guide was, um, was Bill Magwell, who was our editor, who was the playwright that I met while I was at the Academy. Uh, because he was coming in, so I think he came in and was rehearsing some pieces and doing some stuff and whatever. And then they get over there, there he is. Um, I was made the advertising director. Uh, I, and then I, one of the things that got me in there was my article. Because Don liked my under the lights. And he said, you, you need to do this for us. He goes, and I understand you can sell a few ads. Or he would go, um, you could go to talk a few, you could talk a talk a bit. And I went, okay. So um, I became the advertising director. Um, we set up offices at Piedmont and Cheshire Bridge. Um, and uh, nice space, big, big, big group of people. John George was our graphics designer, who I also played softball with. Um, our office manager was Troy Holder, that's actually his name. Um, and um, there was Don and Jerry Hanna, who was a manager, who was a um, corporate officer dude with Kroger, um, <clears throat> was also sort of our manager or whatever. He just ran the company. He was oversaw everything and um, wonderful. Um, incredible energy, really, really good. Um, the Academy Theater moved him to the 14th Street Playhouse. I was actually there with all that drilling and whatever, whatever was going on. And I decided to move on because Margaret Ferguson, who was the managing director there, I have to say her name after having Bob Swindon, Margaret Ferguson. The, the, the input and the effect this woman had on me, learning about theater, learning about marketing, learning, of, she, she would come and sit on my desk, just take a space and sit on my desk and explain to me, with her pencil, pop a on top of the head, and explain to me things about how you do stuff and whatever, that had me understand just incredible stuff. Barbara Lebo did this play, and um, it was called Sending Time, and it was about um, Auschwitz. And we went over to the Colony Square and met with this lady. And we sat down there and she said, Greg, I need you to come with me. This is my meet the lady. I said, you're talking about the Auschwitz survivors. She goes, yes, and this is just me and you. We can't talk about it. Okay, I'm talking about it now. I'm going to say God rest. So, but anyway, met with this woman. It was something I will never forget because it taught me that the importance of telling a story, be it on a play, be it through a song, be it through a book, be it through whatever, is part of the human experience that we must share because that's what I must do. We don't all have to do it, but that's why I'm here. Um, we sat down with this lovely lady, and she leaned forward, there the numbers up her arm, all of that, and she told her story. And I remembered sitting there and even afterwards, we laughed and whatever. She, she, I, we would, I hugged her neck and just really wanted to And we walked away. And Margaret said, "You just held it together through that the complete thing and all that." She says, "I'm very, very proud of you." As we're coming down and about to cross over 14th Street, whatever like that. And then she looks at me to talk at me, and the tears are pouring. But I kept it 
through that whole interview and everything, I was a smile, and I was looking at her, and I have eye contact, and I'm just whatever. My point of mentioning all of this is that when I went to work for Guide Magazine, those things from Cruz, the bomb, the orientation to connecting with the people to whatever, to Margaret and the story, uh, please and understand and never forget that life is a part of what you're doing. It is, be it theater or magazine or whatever. And so we get to guide, and that's when, with that publication, I realized I had to, I had to work here. Because it did what the Academy Theater and what Pulse did, and I have learned some things from Bob that I think I can bring to this, and they did too. So in that case, and then I started writing Gad About, which was about getting out and going, have the race car and my logo running over, with, over my head, and whatever like that. Um, I had to have a speedy Bentley with the chauffeur in, as you know, just kind of all that. But the point was is that it was getting out and about, and I made a mix of it because it was going to shows, it was going to drag shows, it was going to the theater, it was going to dance, it was going to concerts. It's one of the first pieces I wrote where I had William Fred Scott, the first openly gay conductor of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, do an interview with me. I got the People's Choice Awards each year comes out. Fred Barber, Fred Barber was a phenomenal producer, creator. He just loved creating. He did pageants and whatever. And each year we had an event called the People's Choice Awards for Best Bar Manager, Best Bartender, Best Performer, Best Publication, Best Writer, Best Director, Best This, Best Activist, Best Yada, 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 Yada. And I got Writer of the Year. Was it for a particular piece that you did? It was for Gadabout. Okay. For, for Gadabout and Guide, Ma Guide Magazine. And it was the first year I wrote it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but the thing with Gad about that allowed me to do was just to get, and I got, you know, and we got more of the variety. But that's what Guy did. And of the publications that I worked with, Guy was strongly the People's Magazine. And it was one of the, it was monthly, and it was one of those magazines that you would find. I used to love that. I mean, you'd be like someone's house or, you know, just, it was just because the information, because we gave you, you know, we're a month magazine publication? Well, you got a month. It was one of the thicker, mm -hmm, much more stuff. Maps. We did maps. So here's a Virginia Highlands. Okay, you need to go here, here, here. I remember that. And you'd have the little ones and whatever, what's going on, and how to get to a place. You know, once again, we didn't have GPS or whatever, you so it's, you know, just follow the birds. And, um, but uh, Guy was really, really good. And Don was really good also at being what Bob was extraordinary at. I mean, where he would take us places and stuff. Um, I got my first visit, tour, rounding of Ebor City in Tampa with Bob, with Don, kind of. Um, you know, all of that. We went to Key West. Went to Key West. He and I went to Key West. I was down there. He goes, Take you to Key West. We'll stay for almost a week. The only thing I ask is that we get some Key West in the book. And I went, my bags are on the porch, so if you're ready to go, and cut down on this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and bring the sales slips. So uh, we went down there. Uh, I got four bars in. There were those guest houses, Alexander's, Island House. There were four of them. I got the Alexander's and the Island House signed up two year contracts. So we brought them in. And it was one of the, kind of the first introductions for them also in Atlanta. And you said this was in Atlanta. It was Atlanta. It was Atlanta focus. Got extor exclusively. Yeah. But they would talk about places to go for you to exactly. travel, but it was for Atlantans yeah. to travel yeah. to. And we had some of the stuff, we had places in Tampa, the table, the bars and whatever. And then we would do pieces and articles and stuff to give you more like places to eat in Key West where we had kind of now had connections with these folks and we would have them, you know, you know, send me your menu. What what's what what do people like to eat? You know, why why would I why? Why should I come eat? Do tell me. That kind of thing. And then of course performing and stuff like that. Yeah. And then the next thing you know, we had New Orleans and Dallas saying, Can we send in food? Yeah. So go ahead. I'm and sorry. and so you said this was very much 
for, for the people. It's like for everyone. It was. It was much broad, much broader than, than Paul's, because it was, because he. It was one of the also the first. Time, I didn't think about this. It was one of the first times also where you had a little bit more towards the African American gay community in Atlanta, a lot more, because um, they they created uh, Black Pride right about then. And that was, yeah. And then, so we would do whole pieces on that, and yada, 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 and all like that, and whatever. And, there, you know, Pulse had, Pulse had a couple of other black, you know, African-American um, contributing writers, but that guide, you know, we are, we had, you know, we had a couple, two other staff, there was a girl, Alicia, and she was black. Yeah, so it was just real, real different. And it all depends on who owns it. Just like anything, yeah. you know, it's who manages it, owns it. And again, this one was for free to anybody. It was for free. Yeah. And they also printed one of the larger distributions uh, that I had known of. Not, not bigger than Cruz, but they printed more than Pulse did. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, you're just like, you find your niche. It was, it's, yeah, I'm not sure it didn't find me. Well, Cause yeah. Because I was out there just, you know, it's it's amazing, uh, as John would say, and someone else taps you on the shoulder. Yeah. It goes, but now, let's just, let's just be very obvious. If it wasn't for the fact that I had the occupation that had me in all of these places, because I was, it was go, go, go. And we're out there, and so I'm in public face, I'm, you know, whatever. I'm with a photographer taking pictures of whatever. The owner of the bar are all of the most popular bartenders in every drag way and whatever. I mean, we're going in somewhere, and Charlie Brown's begging me to do these shots with her. Those jello shooters. It was the nastiest thing. Ever. She loved those jello shooters, and I thought, you don't even hear about them anymore. But back in the day, they were just, just and I thought, why? And um, so, you know, it was just like John Austin, uh, the manager at Swimming Creek Gunhead, introducing me to Bob. These people are just around you and they just go, Greg, have you met? You need to. And he owns and he's, this guy is the, and we think whatever. And in most cases, I got the job. Yeah. Um, the only one I did, the only one I said I would just contribute to was David. Okay. David wanted me to be on staff and I went, I'll, I'll, I'll just put in some ads and you just pay me. How about that? Because I like the Academy yeah. Theater and and how wonderful, you know. And Frank T and Frank Whittow, an amazing legend in his own right. So I worked on a theater, but you know. It really is like you just kind of it just flowed. Mm -hmm. It's like from mm -hmm. one experience mm -hmm. to another. It almost is like it was it's, meant to be. It's amazing, also in this conversation thing, and I'm sure you've done it many many times, where you start talking about things and all, you know, stuff starts popping up and yeah. whatever. And in many cases, I have to be honest with you, Morna, in talking about it, there were things I realized maybe I had forgot for a moment, you know, that were part of the steps, you know, so you're going through these things and you're going up and whatever like this, but this is, you know, the what. Yeah. And brought me to, you know, what I do today. Yeah. You know, and was working at uh, Guide Magazine, um, I was in that office at Piedmont Cheshire Bridge, and I used to go to lunch with the lady who was the office manager. The, she's over the complex. She's the manager of the whole property, six buildings and all that, whatever. Joanne and Joanne and I would go eat, and I never get Joanne and I coming back. And she said, "Let's stop here. I got this people. These people have moved out. This the office." And so we went in, and uh, they they left the office open, and she was we were standing there. And I'd always been talking to her about wanting to go into business and whatever. And we're standing at this counter, this nice little granite counter of these people. And she, so I said, do you have to paint it? And yeah, and try and find someone to move in. And she took the keys and she plopped them in front of me. And she said, you keep talking about it. She says, and you, you know, don't you think it's about time? And I went, oh, the pressure. And so then, of course, she looked at me and she said, I think the first six months should just be on the house. Wow. And you just move in and you get it started. And she says, Kids. And I went, okay, and then she just turned and we were leaving. I said, God, it's quite an offer. I really want to go into business. And then we turned around and we were walking out. And I went, you left the keys. And she said, they're not my keys, they're your keys. So, um, Wait, where was that? 
It was 1988, and it was in the spring. And then I went and had, went to a meeting uh, for guide. <clears throat> but we also, when I was doing playbills, I started doing some. I had this little thing, and then I went to a meeting. Um, um, uh, Michael Lomax, City of Atlanta. Um, I forget what he was. He was over the, all of the events and affairs for the mayor's office. Um, had a meeting, and Stephanie Hewley. She was one of the one of the largest performing arts marketing promotion pr production managers in the world actually um, had this meeting and they were talking about the creation of the national black arts festival which would be a multi festival in atlanta of the uh, diaspora the planting of the african seed and the arts creative fun and so i had been invited because michael lomax that found out that I could do programs, and I had been asked to join, and everybody else on this team, Mar I was part of the marketing group, and yada, 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 whatever like this, and said, would you like to do our programs? And so they announced that we are gonna do it, we're going to launch it, uh, and one of our first folks coming in to perform is Roberta Flack, and then we got a yada, 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 which I love because I'm from Black Mountain, North Carolina, and so was Roberta Flack. <laughs> and so, um, I walked out of there, and I sat in the car with my four friends, and I remember I sat in the car, and the keys are in the ignition, and the car's turned on, and I didn't move for a while. Everyone's like, what's going on? And I went, I don't know. And um, I mentioned his name earlier, and I mentioned it again. Ken McNeil, he's sitting right here, looks at me with my shoulder goes, so do you think it's time to use Joanne's keys or what? Yeah. And that's when I, two days later, went and got a business license. And uh, Performing Arts Media is the name of the company. And I proceeded then to go in and have a conversation with Don and thank him and whatever. And he said, it's time, Greg. And, <laughs> and I went into business for myself. And that was August the 6th, 1988. I keep getting that six and that sixteen messed up, and so the um, and so this August the sixth, I will two things: a, be thirty years old, and for thirty years I've produced, well, did programs and playbills almost exclusively, and then in September of '99 we decided because we were doing Atlanta Show Guide, and so we decided to start doing one thing. But I will have been in business for thirty years. And also, late in the month of August, I will come out with the 30th anniversary National Black Arts Festival program. Wow. And I'm still doing their publication for this year. We'll have our 30th anniversary of that this year. And as I said, I did the playbills before, and then we did the show guide. It was a collaboration with the Coalition Performing Arts that I would do this one book about the performing arts, not a playbill, just whatever. And then after a while, I decided, you know, you could do one thing better than a lot. And so today, I am Atlanta Show Guide with the National Black Arts Festival once a year coming. <laughs> but we do only yeah, show guide. Well, let's talk about it um, because it's it's monthly. The Atlanta Show Guide. Uh -huh. Atlanta Show Guide comes out with six issues a year. Okay. Two months. Every two months. Every two months in print and online. Uh, we're in 46 venues, and that's people that you know. Uh, the very first venue I ever put it out in was Robert First Center. They're still with me. Um, so it's and we only distribute at performing arts venues and Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau, DeKalb Visitor Center, and Explore Gwinnett. Um, just just for arts patrons, and it gives you articles on where to go and what to see, ads on the different scenarios available um, throughout. Uh, and then, of course, we are a resource guide. So listings, kids shows, theater, musical theater, concerts, dance, festivals, and activities, which of course we have a lot of right now. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, and and it's it's for everybody. It's not it's just for the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. It is totally performing arts. Totally performing arts. Who? Where are your offices? Uh, our offices are off of Stewart, uh, Buford Highway, and 285. How long did you stay in the offices? 16 years. Really? 16 years. I stayed at, uh, uh, yeah, uh, 15, it's uh, uh, 1575 
1875 Piedmont Road. Um, and I had that little suite that Joanne took me in was 375C. I was there for about two years and went. Because mm -hmm. then came the most incredible, fabulous, wonderful, Lord, I'd love to be in it today, office in the back. And it came up and it was literally the two story building. It was um, 2,600 square feet, which are on kitchen. I had five, six offices, fabulous conference room, elongated, you know, whatever, that you put the flat screen over here, and you got your art up all around and doors closed. Um, you were up, you were in the back facing the interstate, you know, Monroe Drive is coming around by the fire department that back there, quiet back there, just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And we were there, yeah, 13 years okay. easily. And that was, um, it was an amazing office, and uh, then uh, they changed management, and we decided it's been nice. Bye. So um, we moved out by Buford Highway and 285 between Dorval and Shambly. So how many people work? We <laughs> the joke. We went from eleven to seven. Okay. There's seven now. Uh, big difference is the digital. Because we're, it's, I am close to being a virtual company. Uh, the art director and the editor are in. I mean, they have a space to be in, but then they also have other things they do and work from home as well as, you know, I have an office at home. We all have an office at home, you know, such as life, and, or in your pocket, you know, and all of that. But um, grown a lot, really expanded. Um, it's wonderful to be able to know that. Uh, I'm doing a little bit of everything with all genres and whatever. We do uh, six issues a year. Four of them are seasonal. Uh, you know, the, 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 the fall, spring, summer, winter. And then we do a holiday book. It comes out in October, it's good through December because that is the biggie. Uh, the holiday issue, you know, just it's a biggie. Just more nutcrackers and whatever than we could possibly stay in. And then we do, and this is because of me, in the Sprite After the Winter issue, we do a dance issue. And it is also our second largest issue. I feature not just the, you know, the advertisers put whatever they want, everybody gets a spotlight in their listings, but we, from our cover to the feature, promote dance of all types, you know, throughout greater Atlanta, Roswell, and beyond, you know. Um, and with that, and also besides doing listings, of the performances, which are like the same thing the kids shows and whatever and whatever. We put a section on dance classes and studios in the back. We've done that. We've done it. We did our first dance book. We came out with that. That was in 2002. And Frabel, Hans Frabel, did a glass piece that, that we, uh, he's the artist with that go on the cover. Beautiful dance piece. And, um, and yeah, it's been very, very popular. And I have folks, and of course I have a just tremendous group that come in just each year for that. You know, the, the, the dance companies, you know, that nonprofit world for the dance companies, if you're not in ballet or whatever, something like that, it's not very lucrative. So, you, you know, a lot of it's done for passion, and that's my, that's what I tell them. That's why we do it, is because I have a passion for dance. It is, so many of my friends just, we're going to see dance, aren't we? And I'm going, Yes, and I'm going to take you out and buy you a fabulous meal and whatever, <laughs> bottles of Merlot, whatever you need, but let's go. Because in many cases, well, because I'll pick some of these, you know, sort of abstract contemporary pieces, and they're going, really, Greg? And I'm like, yes, really. So, <laughs> you know, because I'm, I'm motivated to something creative. And even things that I don't find extremely popular, I'm not a big hip-hop person, but I can appreciate technical ability, I can appreciate skill level and execution. And so. Um, and with, with, what's your role currently? Oh, sure. So, so what does your day look like? It's everything from checking what we're doing, um, the bait, checking everybody's, you know, my day starts off with the emails, the messages, whatever. And of course I've got a to-do list and three clipboards over here. And so I'm looking at all well, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, checking to see what the, uh, the, the my uh, social girl has done with the Facebook posting 
you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, checking to see my emails to see who needs things from me and what are we supposed to do and whatever. We just two weeks ago came out with the summer book. So I'm also now, like my thing today is to make to do the UPS tracking, to make sure that all of those boxes got in place. Uh, I need to hear from, because the printer, we only get, we do 90,000 books. I don't want 90,000 books on my doorstep. No. So the printer, who has worked with us for 13 years now, um, sends, comes, RNL brings us 20, which go in, so the distribution guy has to, to do small amounts. We have all these businesses that only want like 200 or 250 or whatever like that, as opposed to the 10,000 copies that have to go to the Fox Theater. So with the truck that comes up and the printer drops off, gives us that, and the rest they do for us. So if they drop off at Woodruff, they drop off at Cobb, you know, these places that just like, you know, 25,000 books go to the Woodruff Art Center. No. So, um, but I need to make sure that that happens uh, because I need to hear, is it complete? Is it done? Are we finished? Check with the art director on, we send out e-blasts that go up to our constituents and readers announcing things, this is gonna happen. Are we on time for that? Do I get a proof? When we go into production, we, I can be proofing, copy, making sure there are photo credits in all the photos, making sure this is whatever. Julie is our uh, editor person. She's going through it and she's moved this over. It needs to be IT apostrophe S. So this is an IT S. But she's good at it. And um, But at the end of it all, there's a list of all these corrections to make. And I have to go through and make sure they all happen. And they do it. And is that photo credit? Okay, we do not have a photographer for this. Got to happen. If you don't put the photographer in there, we don't run the photo drawing. And we do a lot of that in the office together, or in the case of when it's proofing to get ready to go to the printer, <clears throat> it's nothing for the me and Kelly, art director, and Julie, to be, well, I was up to 1.15 in the morning waiting for this to be uploaded to the printer and finishing that, and then the printer contacts us at 7.15 a.m. sending us back the proof. Our printer is in Florida. Wow. And, um, so that's my day. Have you become a lot more digitally savvy? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> Go ahead. It's it. Yes. I've had this conversation with more folks and whatever. Is the virtual company down the line? And I'm like, oh yeah. Like, it could happen today and I'd be fine. Because I, I've got a couple of acquaintances or folks or, and friends that I know that don't work in an office. I have this one buddy, he works for, he does, he does marketing. And they are, everybody has their own office at home and they all talk. And then two or three times a month they meet. Yeah, you need to see each other every now and then. And so two or three times they meet, they have this one set place, it's called Goldfish. It's over there on Ashford Dunwoody Road. <laughs> you know, they get a corner, they come in, they say they walk in, the waitress goes, okay. You want all the appetizers, and it's after three. Chardonnay, what do we do? You know, and and then they go, and then they go there, and it's nothing for them to be there like three, four hours, you know. But and so, yeah, I think that'll be my retirement because I can't stop working. This is not gonna happen. You're not. You don't seem the person that that, no. that can do that. It's in the vein. So do you have an ad person? You don't have to do the ads now. You have no, I do. Do I, there's, yeah, there's three of us. I'm sorry, I didn't even mention. Uh, <clears throat> Joy Barnes, who worked with me when I was in the very first office, that little hoo-ha down there. Then she got a job at the city of Atlanta. Uh, she does a lot with the Bureau of Cultural Affairs, Jazz Festival, and so on. She then went on to have JCB Marketing and Consulting, her own marketing firm. Uh, as a matter of fact, when we moved out of the little office into the big, was when she decided to go and do her own thing. Um, and she uh, was real big with working in, and, and she even kind of did a lot when I was working with the Guide Magazine. That's when I kind of met her uh, because her partner at the time was manager of Crazy Rays uh, down at Ansley. And so we would go and, and hang out and do all of that. And, but Joy still works with the city, you know, like that. She's connected with all the marketing and stuff like that. Hartsville, stuff like that's her big clients. Right? Like Hartsville's come into our world. Thanks be it to her. So it would be me and her um, and Chris and Chris McMurray. Chris McMurray also does a lot of the marketing and advertising. Well, he does a lot of the ads with me. 
Um, and so we've done that. The bulk of the advertising client base is mine. And um, the bulk. The thing, with, the thing with Joy that is extraordinary is hers are huge. I mean, you know, hers are just like, you know, and she brings in retail, which is a different rate. I've got nonprofit and I have retail rates. And she's, you know, so her clients just do better. So that helps. That's great. Um, it sounds like you, you know, you find you, your way to like the perfect <laughs> sort of scenario. And um, I want to sort of look, kind of look sort of more. Well, I have one question about your photographs. Because you, you have donated a sizable number of photographs. And you kind of touched on maybe how you got some of them sure. when, when sure. the photographer is like, eh, I don't sure. know. Can you talk about how you managed to amass those photographs? Because they they're really <coughs> cover a lot of the events that you yeah. were doing. Well, it's multi because multiple, multi different scenarios. Because one of the things was the first batch of them happened when uh, they were undoing, uh, when Bob passed. And then um, Pat and Jim were going to stay. Uh, Pat Coleman, Jim Heavily uh, were going to stay, and uh, which they did for like a year, and then uh, or so, and then whatever was. So they were going. They were cleaning out the offices, and this was right at when Bob was leaving us to go and do these treatment things, chemo, and coming and going. And so what happens was. They're looking for space, so they go in and they have all these files of all these photos. It's like, we really need these, we're not using them. And so then, literally, the first batch of them were in a trash can. Uh. A huge trash can that they filled with just with the, with the folders. They just threw the folders. And there was that, and there were posters, and even some of the paste-up boards. Because it was in the art room, obviously. So they decided just, we're not going to use it, you know. And why are we keeping this? Because we've already printed the art thing. So, which I have several of. Um, they had nice art pieces, they really did. Um, uh, especially posters. So then, um, it was literally the day that we had a back porch thing, and that's where the garbage guys came around, and it was literally by the back door at the crew's office in the kitchen thing, and I'm visiting, because I don't work there anymore, and, um, there, looking at it, and I was just, I said to Ray, what's going on? And he goes, let's throw it away. I said, well, why, can I have one? And he goes, sure. I don't see why not. And we took them out. And I remember this was the strangest thing. Just took them out and poured them in the trunk of my car. Just, and it was a big old industrial trash bag. <clears throat> so anyway, that's when it started. The other process, what that happened with me was that going from places or just incidents and times, it was with working with the publications. Pretty much every photo that I brought to you had something to do with the publication. And it probably has run. You could even, remember I even had something where they pasted them up or whatever. So you knew, oh, well, this one ran, which was great because it helped me identify the photographer and the timeline and all that quicker. But that was basically the it. I did this day, even after the first time I started giving the magazines over, I have yet to really realize, and I've been asked at least a hundred times, what motivated me to keep these things? I don't know. But it's an old black trunk, you know, with the flip thing, and I mean old. That thing with the metal thing, and this kind of is some kind of paper faux thing, and it's lined with, with this schmancy, um, it's like a boy's trunk, it's got cowboy's paper black and white <laughs> inside. Old trunk, they don't make them like that anymore. And that's what I would put all of those magazines in and books. And I started collecting them. Um, I started collecting them while I was at, when I came here and I was at Cruise, I kept stuff. Because even when we were coming down to visit, there was all this new things. I've got several, well, the publications that you got, whatever, that were from before, well, the 76 and whatever, it was the earliest one. But the thing was, is that I don't know what motivated me to keep them. And of course, obviously I didn't, that trunk had something else in it. It's just that after a while, I began to get so much stuff that, okay, we gotta move this around, you know, or decided that, 
bell bottoms are no longer necessary, so we have a trunk. <laughs> and you think I'm laughing. <laughs> you think I'm laughing. Well, I am laughing, but, but no. And then after I got to a point where the collection began, when I got to about Guide Magazine time, and I had been carrying all this, and I realized I had some older ones because I would maybe show some folks, and they go, what's around the clock? And I'm going, it was a gay magazine when I was. Well, you know what, for instance. So, but you know, so I just increased it. And then when I was working at, when I was working at Pulse and at Guide, I really upped my uh, collecting. I really, because I have pretty much every Guide magazine that I ever, when I was working there. Uh, and I had a lot of Pulse. I had a lot of Pulse because I liked Pulse's info. I thought it was so bright. I thought, this is mental. This is good. This is the, this is the, you know, it's, it's, there's an engaging conversation here. It was the kind of thing people reading Pulse would have conversations about what, about the article, as opposed to, oh, we ought to go do this, and then you just kind of, you know, whatever. Not saying that Cruz was bad, but you see what I'm saying. And around the clock was very cruise She was just telling you where to go and what to do. But, um, the motivation to, to keep those books, I don't know. I'm glad you did. I am glad I did too, because I got to meet you. Yeah, they're pretty awesome. Well, I now look back at it. I, when I first started going through that trunk, before deciding to do all of this, I went, I don't remember this. I don't whatever. But then you start reading through it, and you're going, wow. And the time and the change and how different. And that's why I really, really believe it's really something that I want to share so that our future for our gay kids are able to look back and realize you know what their past was what their history was what was going on and you have it in writing and it's there and thanks to you and so many others there's going to be digital access so forth and so on the museums because it's not the same and the IT-ness techness of today totally made that, you know, different, and it lost whatever. But there's something about being able to read something and touch something and see something, and, if, and then it'd be something that, well, a few minutes from now, there you are sitting in the room with that and it and whatever, that I think is, is important and, and uh, should be icing on the human cake. I want to sort of think, think about things in a very sort of big picture way for you. For you. Um, can you talk about um, how you think these publications were important for the gay community at the time that they were being published? Mm. Yeah, well, you mean the ones back? Yeah, the ones that you, that okay. you worked for. <clears throat> and the, just, just generally, these, these, these publications that were geared toward the, the LGBT communities. And the, early, and the late 70s, early yeah, 80s. Yeah, why, why <coughs> they were important, how they were important to the community? Well, because you had nothing else. They were Cruz was a Bible. Uh, it's a very thick book, uh, but it, and again, it was about the bars and softball games and what to do and all of that kind of stuff. But crucial information, and there was nowhere else to get it. You know, you're talking about a time period where, <clears throat> you know, being gay, the queer was a bad queer. Yeah. Let's go that way. And um, mm -mm. this was a Bible. They printed. I can't remember the figure, but I remember it was just this enormous amount, and it was nothing for the books to be gone, hard to find, and they came out every week. Uh, it was a, there was nowhere else to get it. Um, in that 70s period when I moved here, it was a, it was a very kind of, uh, the, the hippie thing was kind of moving over. I'll never forget the guy that used to stand out there and give out, what was it, the, oh God, I can't remember the name now. Um, on the book on the streets, but there was the great cycle bird. That's it. Thank you. Um, and so at 10th Street, <laughs> and, but the the thing is, is that it was the, that's the only resource you had. You had no online. You had no whatever. So this was it. So you got this magazine, and you knew what was going on, and that was it. Bible, and and then from there. You know, it was just who you talked to and what you did. That was the total communication. That was something that I think um, 
today's readers um, shouldn't take for granted, but should be grateful for, because the access you have to this extraordinary broad in the cloud via the whatever, you know, access to information and places to go and things and so forth and so on is just unlimited. And you are also at the disposal of the amount of information that the person publishing the publication could put in the book. Whereas now, the amount of information is more than you could ever care. Uh, but then, they gave you as much as they could, you know, and... Uh... I always, I mean, there's something, it's, it's just sort of crossed my mind, it's like, there's always been this emphasis on the importance of the gay bars mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a place for community, mm -hmm. especially, you know, in the 70s and 80s, when, mm -hmm. you know, it was really important to find your community. Exactly. So a lot of these publications, we're getting the, we're, we're guides to get people yeah. to find their community. Yeah, you had you had no other resource. If you went, I remember looking at something, and it was after the fact, but like looking at um, like a, a convention and visitors bureau kind of resource kind of thing. I'm sharing the name, but in there they had all the places to go and things to do and whatever like that. Zilch, gay, nothing. Yeah. There was, there is nothing gay listed anywhere. It was, it was part of my orientation when I was with Bob and them. It was more of a group staff meeting kind of thing, where he was explaining that what you are doing is providing the only network between your community and the businesses, whatever. But also with this, this is allowing members of the gay community to get out and be with others. It is also the only way you're going to get to learn what's going on, what we're wearing and what we're not wearing, who we're not talking to or dealing with, who your friends and your whatever are. Just, you know, you know, and not everything has to do with, you know, Charlie Brown or Jelly Shoes, but it also has to do with just life itself. And one of the things See, there wasn't a whole lot, even though we were uh, looked down or frowned upon or whatever, there wasn't a lot of pressure on, you know. I, I, we'd already had the incident of Stonewall, mm -hmm. um, so there was that. But, you know, I moved here in 78. Stonewall wasn't that far away. What was it about 10 years earlier, 68? And so... You're talking about this whole thing where that was still around. And only months, only years before that, when I moved here, I had found out that even some of the drag queen places, some of the places where men were in drag and whatever like that, had to wear men's clothing. You had to, so you're, you've got on a dress and all like that, but then you got your boxers on underneath. Hello. And, you know, it's just, well, as long as the color coordinates or whatever, I guess it's all good. But, the, the thing was is that that mentality from the government or the social whatever is still there towards you. Yeah. And so that's, that's, that's what you have and that's all you have. And one of the things with Cruz that was kind of unique was, is that, that I thought was kind of unique, was uh, that, it, that there weren't more publications. There weren't a lot more. You had them kind of come and go, but there weren't a lot more. And I was, I don't know if the AIDS thing had much to do with it, but as we got into the 80s, because when we got to about 84, 85, right about the time that, you know, Cruz was going away, there was, you know, because there was David, there was the Midtown Magazine, which only lasted a year, there was the Midtown Times, they were late 80s, they only lasted two years, I knew the publisher, Sonny, Earl Sunny Moon, very, very well, he also opened the Metropolis, which was that bar that took over the answer lounge. But one of the- Et was there too. <clears throat> et cetera was right after, you know, et cetera was in that time period. Um, and there were all these publications um, and they just, you know, um, it exploded in that time period. Yeah. It really did. And it's, there's also something that's just also, I just thought about, it's like how important it was that these ads were there so that the, the community knew mm -hmm. which businesses were mm -hmm. like friendly toward mm -hmm. them. Because I mean, you, you, could, you could have, there was just, the prejudice element was yeah. so hard. And it was just, uh, and it was very there. I remember just wanting to be sure where to go and what to do, 
But I lived on Cheshire Bridge at the Wishing Well Apartments, which was majority gay. It was amazing the drag queens that lived there. I was looking to live with Lisa. It was amazing the drag queens that lived there. Only one other worked with the Gunhead. There were all these other drag queens that worked at all these other bars that I got to know. That's where I met Tina DeVore and just mm -hmm. on and on and on. And then, so, but Cheshire Bridge, was, uh, was, uh, Buford Highway was very gay. There were like four of those mega uh, apartments of now the barrio, <laughs> but uh, very Latin. But they, um, you know, were just gay, predominantly gay. And then you go to Cheshire Bridge, which was just all of that. And then even in town, Ansley, mm -hmm. which is still, but back then even more so. And, um, and there was Gene and Gates, which was the cabaret. And there was the Ansley Playhouse, which was a theater. And, um, and then Crazy Rays and all of that. And then Burkhart's. But it was just, um, the, the, but Midtown was very gay, I mean. The big trees, as we called it, over in the or in the, in the neighborhood over there. It was just unique. I mean, I I remember. I never forget. I don't remember who I was talking to, but I never forget the joke that was made about. Well, the straightest guy here is the postman. And this mailman pulls up down the thing and he goes, "Hey!" And it's just the nelliest guy you've ever seen. And I just remember putting my glasses down and going, "Mm-hmm." You were saying. I mean, just you know, it's just kind of thing. It was just crazy. Uh, and that was to Grady High School, but the, um, but yeah, it was, and the uh, the value of the service of that of those publications and the limit that was, and uh, I think it's something I didn't I didn't take for granted, but I but I but I but thank God I was made to understand that you've got a mission, it has a purpose, it's important, now let's just get our values up. Well, I'm very glad that you worked for all these publications. I've, I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you about them. I need a nap from just talking yeah, about yeah. them, but thanks. They're so, they, they really are very important. Very yeah, important. I thought so. I got it. And I got the fact that I had a mission. Yeah. I didn't realize it. Because like I said, I didn't sign up. I just kept going because I was motivated. I liked it. <laughs> so. It's so great to see someone have a career that is actually career that's right for them. Yeah, I know, and not what you signed up for. So you go to college as a biology major, you come out as an art teacher, and then all of a sudden you just wind up gay, okay, and now I'll do theater too, whatever, but work in the publication industry. But um, it found me, yeah. and I'm very, very happy and very grateful for it. Well, I'm grateful for you. Thank and, you so and much. And I, I, I really appreciate you sitting down and talking about all of this. And for all that you all do too, it's a gift as well. It's win -win. Yes, it is. Well, I'm going to end here. All right. And thank you very much. Thank you, Borna.